G'day, welcome to this update on Jeju Flight 2216, which crashed in Wuhan, South Korea, just on two weeks ago. This is my second video within about 24 hours. Yesterday, I released my first video on what I thought were pilot decision-making processes, given what we knew. Just overnight Australian time, we've received information from authorities in South Korea that both the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder on the aircraft lost power about four minutes prior to the aircraft uh, crashing and claiming the lives of 179 people. This is extremely rare for this information to be lost and for the systems not to be powered. They are designed to be powered, even if engine driven and auxiliary power unit driven uh, AC power systems are lost. So battery systems should be enough to keep these recorders functioning. It's very rare for them to be lost. And we're gonna take a look at what that might mean in terms of broader system failures and potentially electrical failures that might've been cascading and causing the pilots to make the decision to rapidly come in and land. At the end of this video, I'm gonna to touch on a automated system that was being developed about 15 years ago that may well have assisted these pilots to accurately plan their approach and landing, even without power. So stick around and check that out. I'd be keen to know your thoughts. We need to do something to make sure these incidents aren't repeated in the future. The reason I'm putting together this video is that I'm a former Australian Navy and Air Force pilot and simulator flight instructor where I used to train Air Force crews on handling exactly these kinds of emergencies, which are unpredictable, very hard to deal with and they're time critical. It's something that's close to my heart because I've seen how difficult it is for pilots to pull off. Now this is a real life occurrence of this happening in South Korea and we can see what the consequences are. Okay, let's take a look at this diagram here. This is the overview of the timing prior to the aircraft hitting the crash site. You can see here 9.59 and the crash occurred actually at 9.03 approximately. So that's exactly four minutes which corresponds precisely to when they believe the power was lost to the voice recorder and the data recorder. Okay, what we know at the moment and information from the ground as well as investigation of the wreckage will be key in determining the key, the causes here or the actual causes, but we know that birds were struck. That's been confirmed already with feathers and debris found within the engines. Uh, and we know that you had a compressor stall here and damage on number two engine on the right. There was potentially also damage on number one engine and there remains the possibility that the crew inadvertently shut that engine down, but that's only speculation at this stage. Okay, video again of the aircraft coming in, flare to land with both engines visible. We can see the right engine, number two, which was the bird strike engine in the previous image, showing heat haze there, which indicates that engine is running. Number one engine, we cannot be sure of that. So that supports the view that there was partial power available to the aircraft at a minimum. And that being the case with electrical failures and system malfunctions, that would be something that would lead the pilots to want to make a rapid approach and landing. Other factors here, as you can see on the diagram of the vertical profile coming from ADSB data is uh, at about the time that the Mayday call was made and when power was lost, the CVR and FDR, the aircraft was at low level, only about uh, 500 feet here. So not a lot of altitude to work with, especially with a partial power situation and needing to get the aircraft around to a runway and land. Um, again, there's this valid discussion here. If this was the aircraft position, why didn't they continue runway 01 to land? We don't know. Okay, in the previous video, I talked about potential causes of this accident in terms of scenarios the pilots had in their head, what they were experiencing, what would have led to the behavior they exhibited to make a rapid approach and landing. Uh, I talked about three potential scenarios. I ruled out loss of thrust based on the information we've just seen about that operating engine and that left me with severe uncontained fire and potentially cascading system failures and it looks like this failure of the flight co uh, flight data and also cockpit voice recorder would support that thesis okay this is a diagram i've put together which indicates the aircraft position when data was lost and then the tracking the aircraft would have flown to fly a full traffic pattern this is two mile spacing from the landing threshold and two mile uh, final intercept Okay, and this diagram here shows the track miles approximately for that entire pattern. So about 9.2 nautical miles for the full pattern, noting the crew may well have cut it short. And had the aircraft been flying at about 180 knots, that would have been three minutes. Noting they were without full power, the aircraft is most likely flying at a higher speed and a shorter traffic pattern. Again, equating to about three minutes, a very fast approach and landing with minimal time to run checklists. Right, a lot of the discussion continues about whether there was time and the ability to extend gear and flaps. Looking at the gear extension checklist, this is from the 737 MAX 8. So a very similar checklist, but not the exact aircraft. It is relatively straightforward. Uh, there's a couple of conditions and notes to give background to the pilots, but the key actions here are to pull the manual gear extension handles. 
wait 15 seconds after the last gear handle is pulled and then put the landing gear handle down. Then check the landing gear lights to indicate whether the gear are down locked. So that looks like a relatively straightforward checklist. However, the position of this handle is not great at all. This, all right, this is a video within the 737-800 uh, showing the first officer's seat and the manual gear handles below this panel. So not an easy panel to reach and someone of shorter arms would have struggled to get in there and to make that selection of those three handles in rapid sequence whilst a lot of other things are going on. Okay, alternate flap extension. Again, this is from the 737 MAX 8. Very similar checklist, but not identical. Would require uh, a couple of key steps. Firstly, the alternate flap position switch, holding that into position for about 15 seconds to get the flaps to schedule down. Uh, and then actually checking the position and running landing data to confirm that the approach is being made in accordance with the aircraft configuration, that the speed is correct. Uh, again, on the MAX and the NG, the location of the switch is not ideal at all, particularly if the captain is flying the aircraft and the first officer is reaching across to the switch here to activate alternate flaps and then to drive the switch down. So that requires pretty much max reach from me and I'm six foot three. You can see here the normal flap position for the first officer to select and that is the normal position you'd expect them to be manipulating. That's where the muscle memory is. Alternate flaps is something you wouldn't select very often and it would be quite rare for a crew except for the most experienced, to be very swept up and able to rapidly select that whilst other emergencies are going on. That's quite an advanced skill set. Most crews will struggle to do that, particularly less experienced first officers. Um, so where does that leave us? Effectively, that leaves us at a situation where you had electrical potentially and other systems malfunctioning on the aircraft with a severe lack of power. So it looks like number one engine may have been shut down, number two engine suffered a compressor stall and damage due to bird strike. So the crew and the captain would be carrying out what's called an immediate risk management process. So that's balancing flight risks as they understood it at the time. Key risks in the captain's head would have been whether total loss of thrust was going to occur and that engine with bird strike damage was going to quit entirely, uh, whether other electrical systems were going to be lost or other malfunctions were going to be experienced. And lastly, if there were other onboard system failures, potentially fires, whether they were going to get worse. So all these things would have added to a imperative to get on the ground as fast as possible. Now, of course, we're trained and the captain would have been thinking about balancing that, needing to make an accurate approach and landing so that the aircraft could have stopped in the runway available, uh, getting the flap and gear down to allow, again, stopping performance and lastly, stopping distance. So making a check of whatever uh, performance data there was, whether that was on a computer or a iPad type tablet or actually getting the manual out. So very difficult to uh, second guess and judge the crew on this one. Anyone in the situation would need to make their own determination based on their experience and their training. Uh, and something to note also that's been raised is if the gear wasn't down, as was the case with this aircraft, then the above wing spoilers wouldn't deploy. Now it was only when getting under the C-17 after having a helicopter career prior to that, that I really learned that these spoilers weren't about drag and slowing the aircraft down so much as destroying lift and causing the wing to effectively unload and more pressure to come onto the main landing gear, thereby allowing the gear uh, to have more effectiveness in braking. So without that, it is very, very hard to apply braking pressure. And you'll see in the video of the aircraft pitch attitude as it skims down the runway with no gear deployed, that the aircraft's resting really on the main engine nacelles and on the tail of the aircraft. So rather than being level, uh, it's got a nose up attitude, which would have put angle attack on the wings and generated not less lift, but more lift. So even less friction on the fuselage and less ability to stop and slow down. So where does that leave us? So effectively the pilots in a situation, the captain's really having to make the decision there on how to recover the aircraft in a time critical scenario. So in my last video, I touched on EASA evidence-based and competency-based training. I touched on the big focus on what are known as uh, behaviors that need to be trained and uh, seen in pilots, and in particular, the soft skills or the non-technical skills. Now the three I focused on were leadership and teamwork, problem solving, decision making, and workload management. Um, I would say situational awareness was a, was a major player here along with procedural application, but we can see where we go specifically with decision making if we delve into it. I'm gonna jump straight to 6.5 here because given the situation, it was quite dire, no doubt, a rush decision needed to be made. The pilots and the captain would have needed to identify and really consider the best options. So can they delay the approach and landing and carry out some checklist try to confirm gear deployed, try to confirm flaps deployed, or was it too grave and did they need to press on? 
And importantly here, skill 6.8, adapts when faced with situations where no guidance or procedures exist. Now this is the situation I would think the crews found themselves in and this is very difficult to do, particularly with that extensive simulator based or scenario based training, looking at the different possibilities and different eventualities. That is very hard. There is almost a limitless amount of possibilities crews can face. And that's really what this training aims to achieve. And obviously as an industry, we're still working our way through there. We're still coming up to speed. What I want to touch on briefly before we wrap up things is, is something I came upon when researching an earlier video, which I released last year on US 1549, Chesley Sully Sullenberger and his famous landing in the Hudson back in 2009. Uh, so even back then there were systems available and systems being developed which could compute the flight path of the aircraft down to landing and compute the optimal way to fly the aircraft. This is a academic document that was released just after the accident. So in April 2010, when the accident occurred in 2009, uh, it's about a system called the Adaptive Flight Planner. And it says that the Adaptive Flight Planner was tasked with identifying emergency no thrust landing plans for the A320 at a series of different time delays after the dual bird strike occurred. So this is using this system that they had developed based on a fairly rudimentary computer to compute the landing performance required in Sully's accident. It goes on to say that our adaptive flight planning software written in C computes landing flight plans in under a second on a single core PC. So very basic technology indeed. With sub-second real-time response, an emergency landing plan can be presented to the pilot just as he or she is beginning to consider options, maximizing efficiency with which the plan can be executed. Here's a diagram of the landing data and the landing trajectory that's computed by the system in under one second uh, in terms of the flight position and landing either on the Hudson or back at LaGuardia. So whilst this is a very different situation we're looking at, clearly the pilots would have benefited from having a system that could have aided them in decision making in terms of time they had available in terms of landing options and even analyzing aircraft system performance. Now it's very rarely that these type of situations are encountered, but as we can see from this accident, when they do go wrong, they are catastrophic. I think it's time now in 2025 that the industry steps up and puts the political will and the impetus into developing these AI-based systems to assist pilots and maximize flight safety in these very, very rare, but very, very risky in-flight events. That's it for the video today. I hope you've enjoyed the update. If you have found value in this, please leave some comments below. Let me know what you thought was most valuable and anything else you think is worth looking into. Cheers.